We will be using a weight today. If you have a kettlebell, we'll do something that's called a kettlebell swing, but you don't have to use a kettlebell. You can use a regular hand weight if you want. Um, we're going to be doing things with our lat. So again, same weight you use for the kettlebell swing can be used for that, or lighter or heavier. We're going to be working with our core structure. We don't need any weights for that. With the lunge, we'll have the option of using a weight with the lunge. And we're going to be doing what's called a French curl. Now in a French curl, it's best if it's done with uh, a couple of weights. Same, same weight, a longer weight bar. You should be bringing the ends of the weights together and you don't need a lot of weight for that. It is a tricep muscle action. So there you go. If you have things like a strap, uh, we can use that in place of a weight for the lat work. And if you have one of these circular straps or you have a strap that you can tie together to make a circle, we can put that around our legs when we're going to be doing some uh, sidestepping squat and that will make that a little more intense. So those are the things that you can use that you might uh, want to have. Here, a couple of things set. Okay. All right, so I've got everything out of my way. I've got my equipment next to me and I hope that uh, you've got that ready as well. And remember, if you have questions, especially since this is a relatively new routine, you have some questions, absolutely. I'm turning the mics off, but you turn your mic on at any point and ask those questions because that's not only uh, something that's gonna help you, but it can help somebody else in the class too. Let us begin the warm-up if you're ready for it. So stand when your feet are about mm, hip to shoulder distance wide. Begin your bit of twist and turn. Let the arms begin to sway outward and increase that movement whatever amount you would like until you have a nice twist, a nice arm action, a nice plop of the arms against the body. Start to feel the changes that a warm-up creates immediately within our range of motion, within our flexibility. So we start to feel that happening to us. And that is great. And then we're going to take our arms and create another movement. We're going to create the forward and backward movement because that's a different angle on the fibers of the shoulder. And so we want that to, uh, to be happening, get the, uh, get the activation in a different angle. Remember, if you need to do these movements for longer than I'm doing them, by all means, if you need to do them for shorter, that's fine. And then let's uh, rock the weight back onto our heels, lose the balance a little bit so you know you're really committed to it, rock it toward the toes, and we go back and forth with these two movements. And there we go, backwards and forwards, feel the loss of balance, create the situation that you have to recover from. One foot going forward to the toes and then back toward heels as well. So back and forth we go. And then the other side, to the toes, back onto the heels. We lose our balance effectively. Great, now stand feet about a hip distance, take a deep breath in. And as you're exhaling, you start pushing until you feel your chest muscles engage. And keep the pressure, although you may change it as you're coming up, you may push harder or lesser to keep the chest muscle engaged. Inhale, draw the arms apart. And then exhale, push. Inhale. And then go from one side to the other. Pressure. Feel the change in action. Inhale. Again, press. Inhale. And then change which direction you're going. Push. And again, it matters the order of contraction, the muscles that are combined in an action, and it varies based on our posture. Lift up the chest, squeeze together the shoulder blades, reach those arms back, exhale. Let those shoulders go forward. Make it really wide between the shoulder blades, take a deep inhale. Reach and squeeze back and exhale. Forward shoulders, inhale. And then once again, reach and squeeze back and exhale. There we go. 
All right, stand so that the feet are about shoulder distance wide, push the feet and the knees away from each other. Maintain that action in the outer hips and pull in your core. Keep the chest up and keep the shoulders down. Push onto one side because you're tilting that way. Support yourself, lift the ribs, lift the arms, stretch yourself comfortably up, take a deep breath. Exhale and get yourself all the way up and out of that. Press out the legs actively, belly in, chest up, shoulders down, push into the leg, tilt, lift the ribs, stretch, deep inhale. Exhale, bring yourself up and out of that. And now take your feet wide and put your hands to those bent knees and be soft as you reach across. Just soft, soft stretch, breathe. And then the other direction, nice and soft, breathing. So when we stretch prior to uh, weight training, we don't stretch really hard. We're not trying to make extreme lengths and muscles. We're just trying to move the fibers a little bit, open them up a little bit. I'm going to shift my weight over to one side in the center. I'm going to straighten the other leg and I can stay up higher. I can go to whatever depth, take the hands on the knee or take the hands down to the floor, whatever you want. And then we're going to go the other way, whatever distance down, whatever feels right. Sometimes I'm doing this just so that I notice what's going wrong, right? You know, what's happened? What happened yesterday? What's happening today? Just feel it. And again. And then in the center position, you can have the hands down on the floor. You can even rest the elbows on the knees. Lift the hips. Try to let the head at least hang. Get a stretch in the hamstring just to open that up a little bit. Stretch that spine a little bit. And then bending the knees, we come up from that and we're going to do some squats, some pre-work squats. So I'm going to have my feet shoulder distance wide, not as wide as the mat. Weight on those heels, arms going forward, my knees, my toes are going to point in the same direction. We come down, we put the weight on those heels and we press and we come back up again. So we want to feel it in the glute. So we go end of the heel, onto the heel, onto the heel and then press. Now, if I, I wanted to be a little harder, I cross my arms because then my arms aren't compensating with the weight forward and the weight of the arm coming forward. And so we just, you know, we can do it that way. We don't have to. Weight on the heel, weight on the heel, weight on the heel. And if I want to eliminate the tendency of my chest bending downward, I stretch my arms up, I keep my arms pointed up, and that limits how much I bring my chest downward in compensation. Okay, so we created the action that has warmed us up. All right, so we want to uh, proceed with our action. The first thing we're going to do is both an arm and a leg action. It's called a kettlebell swing. And indeed, you may have a kettlebell, or maybe you don't have a kettlebell, but you do have a hand weight. So I'm going to show you first with the hand weight the action that's called a kettlebell swing. Um, and so there's many different ways you can hold the weight. You can hold it like so or like this, it, uh, it really doesn't so much matter as long as your arms are comfortable if you're holding a hand weight. And I'm standing with my feet in this uh, relatively wide position because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into a, a, a bent forward with this placement of the weight somewhat toward the back of the heels. And you might think I'm gonna swing my arms forward, but I'm not, I'm gonna push onto my heels, heels pressing away from each other and coming forward. So it's down and then I push through the legs to sort of pop up, down. And my arms really aren't having to come up very high at all. I really don't feel that I'm swinging this. I can and use the momentum of the swing, but I'm not doing this in such a way that's rounding my back, ugh, hoisting with my back. No, I'm down in a squat and forward with the pelvis, down in a squat and pushing, and those heels have to drive down into the earth. Done properly, you'll feel a connection to this. You'll feel, oh, yeah, that's what's needed. You won't feel it in your back. You won't even feel it in your abdominal muscles because that part of the core is just strong and active and stable. And so this is driving forward. And so you got you to gotta get used to the technique of the action. All right. And so it's leg. A lot of leg in that action. And so that's getting us to work a bit of, of that movement. Wanting you to feel the engagement, not so much the quad. I'm just making a note here in my notes so that I know to do an arm thing next, since this is much more of a leg thing than it is an arm thing. And that's good. 
Now, when we're done with that, I do about 10 of them, we're going to be focusing on the lats. And if you have a strap, we can use the strap, and I'm, I'm going to assume that some of you don't necessarily have a strap, so I'm going to show the work with the weight. So you probably have a weight. And I'm holding on my right side. This is my right leg. I'm going to step back. And so this is the weight method of working the, the lat. I'm going to bend both knees. And so I'm in a one leg forward crouch and lean my elbow. And I reach down. And there are, there are three movements. There's the elbow pulling toward the back, shoulder moving toward the hip, arm pulling in like I'm trying to hold a piece of paper against my rib cage. And so it's back toward the hip and toward the spine. Okay? Back toward the hip the spine. Okay, so that's really good with the weight. Get you in a stance, get you full active. But there's another thing that is row. And you could do this seated in a chair. I'm just going to sit all the way down on the floor, which is rather ideal. And I place the strap around my feet. Now I'm not collapsed. I'm uplifted. I'm on my sitting bones. Chest up, shoulder down. I'm going to do this one arm at a time. I'm going to pull the elbow Toward the back, move the shoulder toward the hip, and bring the arm toward the spine, toward the midline of the body, and then I'm going to release. Regulate the intensity using the strap. So the chest up, shoulder stay down, toward the back, toward the hip, toward the spine. Toward the back, toward the hip, toward the spine. Now it may start to look like one single movement, but it's going backward, and, and in this case downward, and then toward the spine. And that gets all the fiber connection of the lat muscles, very thorough. Now, if I just did this and did it at that speed, I'm not thinking, eh, not a big deal. And I'm probably not going to get it into that lat muscle as well. So there is this backward, downward, inward movement. Okay, one arm at a time using the strap. Or, you know. And don't be afraid to change early, because you'll just go back to the other side. You know, if our goal is 10, you can do, you know, five and then five on the other side. So here I am. I'm using that same toward the back, toward the hip, and toward the spine action. And, uh, and our, our target is the lat muscle. So it, it just having a preference, just having a preference for one version versus another is perfectly okay. In fact, if you wanted to do what I'm doing, which is switching from one version to the other, going back and forth with that, okay, good, <laughs> all right. It just gives you a nice little, it's like have a lot, a lot of different things on your plate. Chest up, shoulders down, so it's I'm pulling back, I'm moving toward the hip, I'm toward, toward the spine. And sometimes our physical condition, you know, maybe I can't get into that position, the stance, for the standing lat work. I mean, I could put my knee and my hand on a chair, but maybe there's something going on on that one side. Maybe it's better for me to sit and use the strap and, and create this pull. I want our um, I want our body training, our weight training to be uh, life proof. In other words, whatever's happening in our life, we can still do the training that's gonna make us strong, that's gonna keep us physically active. So we may have to back away from it or we may have to uh, intensify it in order to keep it always the appropriate workout for us. But it's well within our ability to do that. Okay, now we're going to be working the outside of the hips and we're also going to be working the glutes. So here and back here because we're going to be creating this sidestepping squat. So I start off with my feet about hip distance wide. They don't have to get any narrower than that. And I'm going to step out to the side nice and wide. And then I'm going to take my arms either forward or upward if I want it to be more intense, pushing onto my heels, the arms come back down, and I take the step to close the distance again. And I'll take another step out. Okay, I got room for another step out. And this is nice because it fits into any, <laughs> anything you got. Step the legs close, and then I'm going to go back the other way. There. When I'm making the squat, I'm trying to make sure that my knees always point the same direction as those toes. Now, you can also use a strap around the legs. I just want to show you 
I, I can sit because I don't like falling down. <laughs> and we get that strap around this area above the knee. Right above the knee. And I'm not going to take as wide of a stance. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting out hip distance wide, but my step outward isn't going to be quite as wide. And I don't let my legs wobble together. I keep them. If I set them like that, they stay like that. I don't let my knees encroach on each other. So it's not quite as big of a step as, as I would make. So I'm able to, you know, create that. But again, you could just, you know, you could just do it like this if you had a small space. You don't have to travel. Or you could just, if you have a long hallway or something, do 10 steps in one direction, 10 steps in the other direction, saunter back over and take the strap around my leg. It's like, whoa, yeah. Keeping one on the heels. Getting the body to work very particular, the companionship between the uh, glute medius and minimus and the glute max in that action. And yeah, the muscles along for the right, the hamstrings helping too. Very good. Okay, now core. We've got two areas of this core. I'm going to show you a, a gentler version of this, and then I'm going to show you, for those of you that are like, eh, it's really not making me work hard. Okay, <laughs> okay, it's valid, it's valid. All right, so it's going to be a curl to a bridge position. Now, the simplicity of it is that I could start off just on my back, and my feet can be really close to me. And number one, I'm going to get my abdominal muscles to flatten my back. So my back remains flat, my belly remains pulled in. And then I'll bring my knees towards me and it's fighting. Oh boy, it was hard to keep my, my back to be flat. And so we're in this phase of pulling inward. And if you wanted to stretch, you could. Then we're gonna bring the heels down as close to the seat muscles as possible. Pushing on the seat muscles, engage the seat muscles. Knees toward the toes, reach knees out. Now, when I come down, I'm going to land on the seat muscles and my back is in an extended position. And then I purposefully flatten it and then I pull my knees in. And then I push my heels down. And then I reach the knees toward the toes. Seat muscles engaged at the bottom and at the top. Okay, so that's the simplistic version. Now, if I want it to be harder, okay, if I want it to be harder during the abdominal portion of this, I walk my feet further away. And I flatten my back and I try and lift up and keep my back flat. Oh my goodness. And then at the end, I pull everything in. All right. So what did that look like again? If I wanted to be hard for my abdominal muscles, my legs were further away. I flattened my back. I was able to keep my back flat and I lifted my legs up off the floor. You can hear it changing my voice. Oh my God. All right. And what if I wanted to be harder in the, uh, in the action of the lift? Well, when the knees are into the chest, I can point one leg up, put the other heel down, push the seat muscle, and lift up like that. Okay? And then I could go back to pulling the knees into the chest, raising one leg, putting the other heel up, and knee toward toe. I just lift it up on one side. All right? And so those are some, those are some reasonable things. So if I wanted to be harder, I'd start with my legs further away. I would flatten the back, keeping the back flat. I'd bring the knees into the chest. Once the knees were into the chest, I'd raise one leg up. I'd put one heel down. I'd press the heel, knee reaching toward the toe. Seat muscle already engaged. I'll come up. I'll land on the seat muscle coming down. I'll lengthen the legs a little further out. Flatten, pull in, leg up, heel down. Seat muscle engaged, reach. Okay, or you're just doing it the easier way. Because that's better for you. Keep, yeah. Knees reach. Yep. Come down. Deliberately flatten the back. There's a lot of contrast. It's, it's like a dance step. It's hard to learn patterns of behavior when what your body really wants to do is to follow the pathway of least resistance. It's going to be like, I don't know. That's why we're doing this the hard way. That's a very natural response. Why are we doing it the hard way when there's such an easier way to do things? I know. But doing it the hard way is what is going to give us the greater gains, the, uh, the improvement of not just strength, but coordination, muscle relationship related to another muscle. 
That's what we're after too, because we may have a lot of strength, but we're not tapping into it. We're not as strong as we are because we never use our full strength. We never get our muscle fibers to fully engage. Okay. When you're ready for it, then we're going to do another leg thing. Now, if you have trouble in doing a lunging action, I want you to first try and just get into a, a warrior pose action, okay? And just stepping backward and into warrior pose. So this lunging action, I would simply transfer my weight to one side, step my foot back, the foot would be completely down at a 45 degree angle, and I would bend the front knee, and then I would step forward, and I'd do it on the other side. I'd step back, make sure my foot was down, bend the front knee, and step forward. And that might be where your knees, where your body is ready. If things are a little easy, you know, a little more okay for you, then you'll take the step back with the heel down, but then you'll raise up onto the ball of the foot and bend both of the knees. And then step forward. Step the foot back. It's, it's flat at first, but then I raise up onto the ball of that back foot, bending both the knees, and then I come forward. All right. Then, you know, if you're saying, oh, I can do that, that's not really challenging. Then you step back and you just land on the ball of the foot and bend the knees. Keep the weight on that front heel. Don't let that knee move past the midline of the foot. Land on the ball of the foot. Land on the ball of the foot and go a little deeper. Land on the ball of the foot and go a little deeper. Start with the arms forward. Land on the ball of the foot and take the arms up as you go down. Land on the ball of the foot. And there are even more ways to make it more difficult. But let's use that for our first round. And those who are saying, you know, I'm not feeling challenged. So either, now here's the interesting thing, we're either not feeling challenged because we're stronger than this, that we've already trained that it's really not that big of a deal for our body to do it, or we're so clever at compensation that we're missing out on the intensity. This is always a possibility, always a possibility. I, I work with people sometimes where they've been doing the very thing that should strengthen them in a very particular place, and I measure their strength, and lo and behold, they haven't been using that muscle to make themselves do the action. So it's always a possibility. So pay attention to your alignment and don't, don't be too concerned, especially the first you know, week or two of doing something. You're getting close, you're doing fine, but we do wanna feel the action in some of the target muscles, which you know, happens to be the back of the leg more than the front of the leg. All right, very nice. When you've done that, now's the time to, um, I'm gonna use two weights and this is the ideal thing. If you're only holding with one weight, okay, um, but two weights would be better and it's okay. Like, you know, if, let's say you have, you know, eight pound, two eight pound weights and that's a little too much unless you've been training your triceps very well. Um, so we're going to have the ends of the weights together like that. And my hands are going to be facing basically in this direction. And what I'm essentially going to be doing is bringing my, uh, weights toward my forehead while keeping my arms in the same position relative to my shoulders, but I'm not going to be doing it in this position. Just showing it to you. It's sometimes hard to see it when I come onto the ground. So here I am on my back and the arms are straight up and I'm putting the, the ends of the weights together and putting it so that my wrists are right above my shoulder. Now I'm just going to bend at my elbows and I'm going to bring that weight toward my hairline and then I'm going to straighten. I'm going to try to keep my elbows from swinging. Okay. And so it's like, yeah. Back up again. Don't, don't hit yourself with the weight, right? <laughs> now, it, let's just say you only have one weight. So what would you do? Well, you would hold, but you would want to hold as if you were holding two weights. So you'd be on the outer edges of the weight. Your hand's a little narrower, and so you bend. And again, coming toward that hairline. And, you know, you can do it with a single weight. Like I say, you know, depending on what your resources are, that might be your best, your best bet. called a French curl. 
and it's designed to get us in the back of the arm, the tricep muscle area. It's designed to work the tricep muscles. And uh, there you go, it's a real good one for, for just training that with the arms in that forward position. It's a nice refinement. Um, and good for increasing grip of the hand. But now we've done that, we're ready to, uh, to go over again these actions in the second round. And I would say that we're now very thoroughly warmed up and quite possibly the second round will be where we're not too tired, but we're warmed up enough to do some really good work. So working with that kettlebell swing. Now, if I do have a kettlebell, then I'm gonna be holding that kettlebell so that my hands grip it like so. Might be the best way to hold the kettlebell. And this one, my little fingers don't really wanna be on the inside of that, so I just hold on with the rest of the fingers. And I stand in a relatively wide, this is actually wider than shoulder distance, a little bit wider than my mat position. I already put the weight on my heels and I'm pushing my heels out a little bit as I come into this bend, a squat bend, and then I push the pelvis forward. Now, the arms will be part of this, especially if you've got this nice little swingy thing called a kettlebell, but don't make the arms move too much so it's not and I don't feel, because when I did that, it's like, wow, I felt that in my back here. So it's down, heels push outward and on the heels. And the pelvis is like pushing forward, pushing. It's a dry, you feel it in the back of your leg when you get it just right. If you're not feeling in the back of the leg, you're feeling your quads, you probably got the weight on your toes. You need to slow down the action. Once you get these, these techniques down, it becomes a lot easier to do the action. It becomes a lot easier once you know there's a downward drive of the heel to push your pelvis forward. Kind of an odd thing, but it does work. It does get us some pretty good action. That was with a kettlebell. And again, don't be disturbed if you have to hold a weight instead of a kettlebell. It is not that much of a difference, a little bit of a difference. It makes the kettlebell more ideal for this, but not so much that you can't do it effectively or, or well or enjoy it. All right, now, lat row. Uh, I, I really prefer, if I'm gonna be doing with a weight, a lat row, that I use my own body. You can have your hand, you know, you can kneel and have your hand down in a kneeling position. I don't have a chair today and you know do it that way but I, I, I like the option where I'm in a crouch because then my whole body's active. I stretch, I'm stretching toward the floor, I feel the elongation of the muscle. I'm bringing my elbow toward my back, I'm bringing my shoulder toward my hip, I'm bringing my arm in toward my spine so I'm holding a piece of paper up against my chest and then down we go and then this yeah all right so that lap work is a really good one and you it, again you could switch after every couple of them if you wanted to especially if you're stuck with a weight that just seems to be a little heavier and you're fatiguing out rather quickly but then there's the strap method the straps are very easy to come by you can get them and they're all graded this happens to be a, a a TheraBand gold strap, which is going to give, you know, 16 plus pounds of, of, of effort when it's stretched to its maximum length. They're very lightweight. They're easy to take with us places. If I'm sitting, whether in a chair or uh, like so, I want to have the chest uplifted, the shoulder down, and then it's that, that toward the back of the body, shoulder toward the hip, arm in like holding a piece of paper. And so it's back down and in as i call it although down can be relative i'll do the other side back down and in and you can do this one side at a time if you're using the strap or you can do all on one side and all on the other side i would tell you that to round out your home gym equipment having stretch bands of various sizes a lot of them especially if we got them because we were doing some kind of physical therapy or recuperation kind of thing. Um, 
they're not going to be the level of strap that you can get that would really challenge your muscles. There's all sorts of straps. Some of them giving the uh, excess of 150 pounds of resistance. Uh, that would not be what I would use for this. <laughs> but um, there are many different ones. There are these, these long flat ones and there's, there's circular straps and, and all sorts of things out there. And, and as I said, to have a, a good home gym, someplace where you can work out in the comfort of your own environment and the safety of your own environment. Yes, straps, the selection of hand weights. The nice thing about straps is that they don't take up a lot of space and they're incredibly lightweight. So nice to have investment. They're also not very expensive, not very expensive at all. So there you go. Okay. The thing about straps is you can double them for double the resistance. Liz, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, you can tie them to things. Literally, you can, you know, put them out. They've got little devices where you can put them in a doorway and create a stretch band. There are so many different things you can do with a strap. And a strap works no matter your body posture. It's always going to stretch where you're going away from gravity towards the gravitational pull of the earth, whatever. It's a very uh, good thing. It's not, and it doesn't eliminate the use of, of weights. So I would say you want both. You want both because weights do something different than straps and straps do something different than weights, but they're great. They're really great to have. Okay. Now we're to the point where we want to get this, this outer hip part active. And I'm going to load myself up with this, uh, this nice little strap. Uh, by the way, you could... If you didn't like the squat part, because let's say your knees were troublesome and you're like, I, you know, I can do some squats, but I don't want to continuously do squats throughout the class because I know it's like, no, that's, I don't want any more torment than my knees can handle. Great. So, you know, especially if I had a strap, then what I can do is I can just stand here and I can just make this step outward. And believe me, this is going to be quite engaging. And you know, it's like, oh, I just do the side walking. And it's like, I'm already, I'm like, oh yeah, you keep doing that. Yeah, I know my outer hips are just like, oh, fire. But the stepping out, and if I can do the squat, okay. I just got, I got a little piece thrown in there, right? So I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> so, whichever. With, if you don't have a strap, you can still walk to the side, okay? You can still do the side walk without a strap, believe me. You do enough of it, it, uh, it works for you. So, you know, these things, it's hard sometimes to know, how do I count that? Do I go up and down the mat 10 times? Do I take 10 steps? It, you know, get to a good feeling of fatigue, okay? A good feeling of fatigue. So what if I didn't have a strap? What if I just want to do the side work? I'm just stepping. I push my heels outward. Push, push, push those heels away from each other. I'm like, wow, I really feel it. <laughs> push. I don't think a toe, I think a heel. Push the heel. You get more out of the heel than you do out of the toe. The toe, that work. That's how we live. We live on our quads. We push off on our toes. We make the quads do all of our work and we don't get strong in any of the other hip muscles and that debilitates us very quickly. Okay, great. Now when you've done that, you're thinking, okay, what was that weird core thing? Okay, so there's two things happening in this core. There's this crunch type of action and then we're pulling in the belly, actually that's three things. And then we're going to engage our glutes and lift our hips upward. What the heck is going on there? And then we come down in a completely different fashion. So here it is without the intensification. My, my heels start off pretty close. I flatten my back, keeping my back flat. I just bring my knees into my chest. Okay. And then here's the second part of it. I put those heels down again. I press on the heels. I tighten the seat muscles. I reach my knees toward the toes. I bring my hips up to the desired height, whatever it is. And I push and I get the seat muscle active, but I come down and I land with my back in an arch. I land on the seat muscle, not on my low back. And then I flatten the back and pull in the belly and bring those knees in. I can do it one at a time if I want. And then I'm putting those heels down, pressing heels, seat muscles tight, knees toward toes, rise up, seat muscles tight. 
come down in an arch position. All right, so let's say it's like, okay, I did that, but that's not really difficult. I can do that. Great. Walk the feet out further. The further the legs are out, the less straightness or the less bend of the knee, the harder it is to initially flatten the back and pull the belly in. And it's certainly a lot harder to keep that happening. Back flat, belly pulled in as you lift the legs up. Oh my God, it runs with my voice. And so there we go. And then when I'm coming down, if I want it to be more intense, I can raise one leg up and put one heel down. And then pushing on the heel, seat muscle tight, I reach the knee toward the toes. I lift my spine in an arch and I come back down on the seat muscle. Hmm, okay. And then I flatten my back, knees toward the chest, but I don't want to have the legs further out. Flatten the back, knees toward the chest. See how much changes your voice. And then heel down, leg up, press heel, seat muscle tight. Reach, press heel, seat muscle tight. Come down on seat muscles. Stretch those legs out. All right, so crunch. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and now another way, if I wanted to be even harder, instead of raising my legs straight up, I would put it parallel. Ooh. So when I'm lifting up and holding it parallel, that's more difficult. And I come down, oh, that was more difficult, okay. So flattening the back and oh, bringing everything in. And so I'm going to be, which one did I do? Okay, coming down, leg parallel. And then seat muscle tight coming up, seat muscle tight at the top, coming back down. Oh, that's just exhausting getting my brain to remember all of those things. And that is part of what we're training. It is mind body connection. It is interaction of muscle to muscle. It's relationship. It's going to make you more coordinated, more graceful. It's going to eliminate the likelihood of injury that comes when a body is asked to do something novel and one muscle doesn't know to engage correctly. It, it, you know, it just, it's, it's safekeeping of a human body that we practice all these hard things. But that's good, that's good. Okay, and now we're gonna be working with the, the concept of the lunge. Okay, so as I said before, your step back could be that you step back and the foot goes down I'm trying to lose my balance there. And the foot goes down and you bend the front knee. And if you want to bend the back knee, it's better to lift up the heel to bend the back knee. And that's better. And, and you can be very slight, like just what I was doing. Or you can land back on the ball of the foot and just practice coming down. This front knee is never allowed to go in front of the ankle. Okay. Um, or you can add the arm action. All right. But there's another one too. There's another intensification. And that's where you take your handy dandy hand weight and hold it near your shoulder. Just on one side. All right. And so you step back and you raise that up. I'll show it to you again. Stay on the ball of the foot. All right. I don't think that's all that much more intense in the arm forward but you know again I like to give you a lot of variety so here it would be at my shoulder and I step back and as I sink down I raise the arm up so I step back might be easier to remember um, technically you could even do this if you didn't intend to go into the full lunge position. You saw that? Yeah. I just stepped back and I went into basically a warrior pose. It's back and you got to stay straight. All right. And so that will take some of the intensity off of what's happening in knee land there. Okay. It's really important that we, uh, that we do the right thing for ourselves, that we don't overwork because we want to you know keep getting strong we don't want to deal with issues or injuries that we create so don't and, and remember 10 is a recommended amount it by all means if you know you're like i'll do six of this or i'll do eight that's fine that really is if you're saying i'm feeling plenty of fatigue right now and i don't need to do the 10 that's great or what if you got to 10 and you're like you know i think i could do some more 
Great, go up to you know 12 or 15, but don't go up to 20 because what that means is that this is not the right intensity for you. You either need to slow it way down, which is my recommendation first, or increase either the weight or the complications so that you are getting that satisfying level of fatigue. All right, good. And, uh, and sometimes we need to just, you know, enjoy the glow of, uh, of doing our thing. Okay. Back to literally being on our back with the French curl. Now, if you were like, I'm not doing the French curl day, I'm not going to be on my back. Okay, you can have the arm like this and you can create, just turn the palm to face forward so we get at least a little bit of the same action. The arm in that position, the overhead tricep, it's tricep, okay, it's tricep. Um, on my back. My arms up like so. I touch the heads of the weight together because I've got two of these weights and the elbows stay exactly where they are and then it comes through. and then I come back up again. This is one where if you are not paying attention, you can bop yourself pretty hard with one of these weights in the crown of your head. You don't, you don't want that. You don't want to have a bruised hairline. That's not. Although some people may say, oh, wow, look, you've been working out. That kind of workout I want. Yes. Let's plan on doing a workout that doesn't leave marks, right? <laughs> but this is, this is uh, I like this one. I really do because it's, uh, it's giving me that just right feeling of fatigue in an area that I'm not normally engaging. It's also making me work my forearms. I feel it just as much as my for in my forearms as I do in my tricep area. And I'm always happy to find something that's engaging my forearms because I know that that's going to make my wrists better, and that's going to make my thumb better, and that's going to make my fingers better. You know, there you go. So it's going to make us really strong. Those jars, oh, we'll be able to open every single one of them. It's useful stuff too. But, uh, but indeed, it's good stuff. All right. So that is the French curl, and very nice. But as I said, you know sitting and doing an overhead with the palm facing forward perfectly fine so remember um you're going to be challenged you want to be challenged but there are going to be some uh non-negotiable things and you have every right to uh to do the things that are that work best for you and to stay away from the things that you know are going to create complications beyond what would be a, a reasonable so you know stick with it and uh and what is not uh, available to you today it can quite frankly be developed as you continue to work with what you can do right now. And here we are in round three. <laughs> okay. So that kettlebell swing. Okay. If by now you're saying, I cannot do another squat. All right. Um, <laughs> there is a, there is a thing I'm going to use a hand weight instead of this little kettlebell. Uh, you know, we called it the kettlebell lift. We did that the last time. And although there is a squat associated with the lift, mm -hmm, you can also do just down and up. Or if the kettlebell swing, you're saying, man, that's working my arm, but I want to work my legs, then do a good morning. Oh my goodness, there's never a wrong time to substitute a good morning. Heels pressing outward, push the pelvis forward. Hey, that looks a lot like a straight leg kettlebell swing. Sure does. So here, I could even use the same weight I was intending to use but I hold it right next to my heart. <laughs> we step out, we push the heels outward, we come down and there's like, there's more weight. And then we push the heels and we push our pelvis forward. So that's like a kettlebell swing. Only my knees get to stay straight. And, yeah, that's nice. Or if I want to make it into the kettlebell swing, I just come down into a squat and push forward. There's a lot of the similarities. Many of these weight training things, well, they actually are built off each other's backs, right? We're standing on the shoulder of giants, literal giants. You've seen some of those weight trainers. So, so indeed, we're, we can use a technique from one exercise to create another exercise because those are both working to create action in the glutes. In the glutes, both glutes and hamstrings, both buddies with each other. So the kettlebell swing or the good morning, those are those are great. Or you can just do, you know, the kettlebell lift without even bending your knees or, or anything or bending the hips. So that's okay. 
that's okay. All right, so feel free to adapt at will to what might work best for you. And then when we've done that action, depending on what you've done, we're ready for getting the, uh, the chest area, the back of the chest, the lat area. So now, you know, I keep talking about a chair, but you know, you don't necessarily have to have a chair. If you could come into a, a kneeling position, you could also do what would be a short arm. And, and although if I put my hand up on the block, I could stretch down a little bit more. I'm still not getting as much stretch, but I'm pulling back toward the hip and toward the body. So, you know, this would work. But then again, I can stretch more here. I get the muscle longer when I'm doing it. It's essentially the same. So those actions are essentially the same. If I had a way to effectively keep this strap on the floor, I could use it that way, but I find that that's pretty annoying. It doesn't quite get in the right angle. I prefer to use the strap from a seated position it's because using you know, it from a standing position is a little too difficult. But this is essentially the same angle. Essentially, this, mm, it's not working against gravity anymore. It's working against what the strap is providing, which is an increased amount of resistance as I create the action. And so, like I say, straps are great. They work a little differently than hand weight, but you know, that's part of the appeal. They work a little differently than hand weight. So remember, there's three parts of any lat row, any lat row. You are moving your elbow toward the back of the body, bending it. You are reaching your shoulder in the direction of the hip. You're pulling your arm firmly to your body so the elbow would move in the direction of the spine. If you do all those three things, you have the strongest engagement of your lat muscle. And that means it's going to develop most of its fibers instead of just some of the fibers. So don't just pull back, I know. That could get your rhomboids between the shoulder blade muscles more. If you drop those shoulders down and squeeze the arms into the body, you will get so much lat, so much more. So add those little extras in so that you can really get that muscle because that is a bigger muscle and potentially going to be more stabilizing to the shoulder than some of the smaller muscles that may, that may be easier to use. Okay. All right, so... Next up, those legs again, those legs again. So we could, I've talked about it, we could just, you know, do the side step, even without a strap. I could just step to the side and then step the other way. Now, one thing about side stepping, if I was just gonna do side stepping and I happen to have a strap, instead of putting the strap down uh, around the knees, I can place the strap around my ankles. And this will fatigue the outer hips even more. So I can take this step and it's like, oh my Lord, this is. But I would do this if I'm only doing the side step. If instead I'm gonna be using a squat, I want this up around the knee line, up here, all right? So that when I take the step, there's my resistance there and I can come into the squat. All right, so that's the difference in the strap placement versus just stepping to the side versus the action where I add the little squat in between. I'm not, as you can see, I'm not going very deeply into this squat. I'll show you a side view. So I'm just, you know, taking a step. And I'm really not having to go very deep. I mean, we can go into a deep squat, but we don't have to. And you gotta be very careful of your knees how deep the squat. You don't have to have a strap to do any of these things. But the strap placement does make a difference in where we perceive the action. So there you go. So do take care of the knees. There is a lot of potential of uh, bending the knee in this work. And so, you know, there we go. All right. Now, what if when I'm ready to do the curl to bridge, I decided I want to take the pieces apart. And I just wanted to work with the abdominal piece, and then I just wanted to work with the bridge piece. You, sure, you certainly could. What's the abdominal piece? Well, 
it's this idea of flattening the back and lifting the legs away from the floor. But it could start right here. I could keep my back flat and I could just work with bringing the legs as low as I can and the belly staying in. Sure, I can bend those knees and bring them lower, but if my back lifts up, uh-uh, that's not the goal. The goal is to keep the back always flat. And there will be a point where you're like, I can't, can't lower my legs any further and my back would come up. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty intense. That's, that's the abdominal portion, but don't neglect, since our goal is to get both, then you would follow through, pressing down the heels, knees reaching away. But the, the regular bridge might be something where you're like, yeah, I can do this, you know, make sure you're nice and tight at the top, you're landing with an arch back. But you could do the uh, one leg straight and then the other leg and just bring it up like that. That would probably make all but the extremely strongest feeling like they're getting some fatigue. So remember, fatigue is our goal. If you're doing something like, I can do that, and I'm fine, I don't feel tired, but I did it. It's like, yeah, that's nice, and that's an expenditure of, of calories, sure. You know, we're, we're working, but we're not, we're not what I would consider working out. By the way, it, it's easier to point the legs straight up when you're doing this. All right, so if you're looking for a way to get started with a single leg action, having that leg point up, it's harder to keep the leg lined up with the other leg, or much harder to keep the leg lower than the other leg. It's like, oh, I just put a heavy weight right there. So you can take the pieces apart or you can do it, you know, back flat and then down and reach and land on those seat muscles. Sometimes too, we're so irritated with one method that we just don't want to do it again. And so you know, a little bit of a change up will, will keep us from being furious at the end of a workout routine. You, don't want that. you want to get your anger out during the class, not create further anger in the class. <laughs> okay, now, next step after that curl to bridge is working through some, some adaptation of the lunge. Okay, so lunges can be hard. I had a step in back because it's a little easier on our knee, but it could just be that we step back and we keep the back knee straight so that we're in a, just a bit of a, a warrior pose. I'm sure you could do all sorts of things like make it into a warrior one. Um, that's perfectly fine. It is the stepping forward again that is part of it. And I'm keeping the weight on my heel to drive me into using the back of my leg. The foot stays down when I come and then it turns, allowing me to create adjustments of down or up. All right, so that's that's the one where I say, you know, balance is really big. And just <laughs> like that. Uh, then just keep yourself in a position where you can balance more. But then those weird things we do with the arms. So there's the one where you land on the ball of the foot. And when you go down, your arms go up. And, you know, some things are going to just be challenging because the brain is distracted by what you're doing with the arms. And then there's the one where I have the weight and there's a weight in my hand. And as I go down, I raise that up. And sometimes it's better to do things without holding the weight, to get the action firm in your mind, and then later add the intensity, the flourishes, the other things onto it. So, so get comfy with it and be willing, especially in round three, to say, oh my God, I'm so tired, I can't balance anymore. Well, great, just back off a level and work with that with that level instead of the you know, greater intensity that is the problem. Good, okay. And then what that's gonna leave us is our, our final action when you're done with the, uh, the, the lunge is the French curl. So, like I say, good reason to have two of the same weights. And to have them ranging in sizes, you will get a lot out of having everything from a one pound to you know an eight pound, but I know there's space is limited in households. So, you know, one pound weights uh, could be duplicated by a can of soup, literally from your pantry. It's usually about a pound. Um, eight pound weight is about what a, uh, a plastic jug of water weighs when it's, you know, depends on the, uh, the container, but about eight pounds. So there are things in our life that we can have that serve dual purpose. Ugh. Arms straight up. 
out if you're on your back. Edges of the uh, weight together. You're bending and this, this is coming toward your Caroline and your elbows are not getting wider. They're staying narrow. I can look right at the inside of my elbows there because my arms are in this particular turn. If I only have a single weight, then my hands are still in the same direction. I'm wisely moving the weight away from me as I change so I don't drop it on my face. <laughs> and there we go. And so that's fine. And then, you know, the thing about it, the, 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 the pointing direction of my hand is, is actually significant to what develops in this, uh, in this action. So if I'm going to need to not lay down and have my arm up overhead, I, I don't want to have the hand turned. I want it turned facing frontward. And then I'm bending and keeping that elbow in line because that's what I need to do. And there we go. All right, so it's just a little different like that. All right, so that would be the way we would do it if we if we were not going to be lying down. Now, everybody is on their own timeline with these things. You're finishing up one, you didn't get enough of another, you haven't gotten started on the next thing because I'm moving too fast for you or I'm moving too slow for you. But we eventually come to the point where we're ready for the warm down. Now, depending on where you are, if you're on the ground, you say, I'm going to stay on the ground. Or you're standing, you say, that's fine. I'm going to start the warm down. We need to make some kind of twisting action. It could be that I'm standing and, and swaying my arms around, which is rather nice because I'm, I'm nice and warm now since the weather is warmed up. So it's like, yeah, this is nice. This is nice. Um, reaching the shoulder across the body. Also, also a nice thing to do. Reclining on the back, knees into the chest, rocking the knees from side to side, or having the feet on the floor, rocking the knees from side to side. That's a nice thing to do. Taking the arms and on your back, bring the arms in an overhead position. All these things that are part of our warm down, which is very important. You don't, you know, we warm up, but we also warm down because we don't want to leave our body, you know, uh, like the the horse that's run for miles. We we gotta we gotta walk it. We gotta warm it down. We gotta make sure that we don't put it up in the stable cold or move on to the next thing without giving the body appropriate comfort. Because if you get into the habit of warming down, you will take away some of the issues that might have been part of your compensation plan. You might have jammed a joint structure or caused a muscle to become overly tight. Now you can release that. It's very important to have that plan. Um, rest. Some people who are, uh, first getting started with uh, with training their body with weights or those who have that as a, a very strong intensity often you know take a nap during the day that they work out it's not a bad idea be sure to get your seven to ten hours of sleep every night and be sure to eat oh my goodness you need protein 30 grams three meals is the recipe that will give us the most out of life the most out of the synthesis of proteins in our body and uh and then just don't have the intensity happening too frequently. Now, if there are questions that you have right now, this is an excellent time for them. Any comments or, or aches or pains that you would like to, uh, to address right now, things in the class or otherwise, it's a great time for them. If you just want to admire the puppy who all of a sudden decided that he's itchy. Why are you itchy? Oh my God. He, uh, he's got a good, great weight training program. It's called Being a Puppy. He, uh, he chases the flirt pole and does all his other puppy training fairly well. He's just the most muscly little guy. You're so muscly. So muscly. Excellent work, everyone. Has he gotten as dark as he looks? He is. Uh, he's definitely darker than he was as a widow baby so uh it, but in this room it makes him look a little darker the uh, the lighting is an effect that makes him look maybe a, a smidgen darker than he actually is but he's got you know the little spots across his back have uh, have filled in across his lovely uh, upper main area he's got he's got a nice little ridge in the in the back of his hair here i call it his little neck mohawk and he's also got these little waddles out to the side. Come on, just quit scratching and show them your, your neck waddles out to the side, which give him a very distinguished mutton chop kind of look too. So he's just, yeah, he's an old school gentleman. That's what he is. 
All right. Great work, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So good to see everyone. So good to have you in class. Remember that tomorrow's class, so we start at 10 a.m. with the uh, all-level yoga class. We continue on at 1 p.m. with a, a deep breath and more. I'm going to talk about some very interesting uh, breathing techniques and, uh, and, and facts and things in that class. So I invite you to join me for both or one if you can't join for both. So excellent. Good to see you. Great job. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Y'all take Thanks, care. Thanks, Julie. You're bye welcome. Bye, bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.